Well, good evening. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And uh, in the medical world, there's uh, something called a guinea pig. You know what a guinea pig is? That's when you try something out the first time on somebody. So you're my guinea pig audience uh, for this talk, and you'll have to bear with me. Uh, and um, it re this talk really comes from a book that I'm writing uh, about trees in the Bible. And uh, in my kind of writing, uh, when I write for the popular audience, you start with a information about like this. Well, by the way, first, academic writing is you start with um, this much inf information and you go to here. <laughs> that gets you a PhD. And in popular writing, you start with this much information and you go to here, <laughs> okay? So uh, bear, bear with me. I'll tell you my um, uh, first kind of interaction with the church and trees. My, my wife and two children and I had become Christians, and this was about a dozen years ago. And we were going uh, to a church called Union Baptist Church. It was a lovely church. It was just what our family needed. Now, they did not belong to the Southern Baptist Convention because they thought if you got on that slippery slope of liberalism, <laughs> It was world government right after that. So, um, uh, but it was, a, it was a lovely church and, and um, they had great ministries and I went on uh, medical missions uh, in another country for the first time uh, with them. And when I was a child, my father and I planted trees. We planted trees at a new school. It was an elementary school that was just opening that I was going to go to in first grade. And so my father uh, went and planted trees there. And I helped. Uh, in my mind, I planted the trees. And those trees are huge now. Uh, and I thought b this church also had a school. And wouldn't it be a great idea if I planted trees there for them? And I told one of the pastors that I would be willing to pay for and plant the trees. And he looked at me kind of odd and said, you know, you really have the theology of a tree hugger. And I was a little taken back. Uh, and uh, that led to me thinking about what does the Bible say really about trees and taking care of this planet. And it's really led in large part to the ministry. And so I'm very grateful to that pastor. And by the way, when I go home to that church, I'm the returning hero. So it, the, the whole story uh, turns out great. Um, let me, uh, the organization we have is Blessed Earth. That's why um, it's the title of the talk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just give you a little background on God and trees. First of all, God likes trees. Uh, this is from First Chronicles. Uh, then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Now why are they happy? Because the earth is being judged. Now this l sort of line shows up about not just trees, but orphans, widows, that sort of thing. They sing for joy because they get their day in court and they know how the judgment's going to go. So the, uh, God likes trees. Um, God likes to look at trees. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This pleasant to the sight is almost a one-off line. It is the only physical thing that's described as being pleasant to the sight of the Lord is a tree. And so we derive from this that God not only likes trees, um, but he likes the look of trees. <coughs> this is from Revelation 22. I don't know that I have to read the whole thing, but the important uh, part of this is that, that John is being shown a vision of heaven. And at the center part of heaven is this tree of life with 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit uh, in each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nation. 
So the, the tree, it, we can begin to see just from these couple of uh, pieces of scripture beginning to take on a meaning um, uh, here. <coughs> uh, every major character in scripture has a tree associated with them. Trees are mentioned more in the Bible than any living thing other than humans. The tree is the major metaphor that scripture is hung on. And so, uh, and we are told to be like a tree. Psalm 1 is, in my mind, one of the most beautiful gems <laughs> in scripture. It's a description of how to live your life condensed into a piece of poetry. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaves do not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. So we're told to be like a tree. <coughs> um, oh, excuse me, the rest of this. Be like a tree. <laughs> <laughs> now, <coughs> it, it's interesting that, that God's throne faces this uh, tree, and we've been told uh, to be like a tree, and it's the most mentioned thing, living thing, as I said. How many of you have had a sermon on trees? Raise your hand. Well, this is my ministry. Uh, I believe that God called me to uh, examine things that are scriptural that the church has for some reason ignored or has lost track of or needs to be tuned into. Trees and their theology uh, is not new with me. I want to show you uh, some examples out of orthodox <laughs> uh, places, uh, the, the tree motif. These are, uh, this is prophecies concerning Jesus and it's portrayed as trees. The life of Moses portrays a tree. This is not New Age uh, textbook here or anything. This is a, a Thompson Chain Reference Bible from 1956. Should we amen? Pardon? Should we amen that? Amen, yeah. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I appreciate amens <laughs> a lot. Uh, this, is, um, this is the tree of Jesus' life, the way they portray it, and the tree of Paul's life. Uh, these are ubiquitous in quality study Bibles going back hundreds of years. Uh, this is from a Thomas Nelson King James study Bible that was published, uh, I think, about 1896. It is, to my mind, the finest study Bible ever made. And there are four full plates of trees in it, uh, and there's over 40 pages just about the plants in Scripture so that you would understand Scripture better. Um, now, he, now the church hasn't lost track of this. It's just lost, I think, its ability to articulate this. Uh, this is Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. In the last 50 years or so, I think this has been the most uh, popular uh, book in the U.S. Um, on Christians. And what's on the front of it? A tree. And uh, apparently this is an update of his. I, I like this tree more. <laughs> Um, and uh, if you look inside his purpose-driven life, these are illustrations out of the purpose-driven life. We've got a tree, the roots uh, branching off, uh, seeds, acorns here, another tree. The odd thing uh, about this is that he never tells you the purpose of the illustration. <laughs> so I'm going to do just a little bit of that um, uh, tonight. 
the um, and, and just just to let you know that uh, that that I'm not out there on some limb, as it were, theologically. Uh, Spurgeon has four sermons that are that are about trees in in Scripture. Um, uh, Martin Luther has this famous quote, even if the whole world were going to go to pieces tomorrow, I would still be planting uh, my tree. John Wesley used to talk about this as he was preaching from the limb of a tree. Have you ever seen how tall he was? He needed a tree to get up into in order to be uh, seen. And as Christians, we are, as far as I know, the only religion that brings a tree into our house once a year. <laughs> Uh, to, to celebrate. Um, uh, and so uh, as I began to really look at trees in scripture, I asked myself, what, why did God use this mechanism? Why is this the major metaphor in scripture? And what I came up with is there's really a code in scripture. It goes from Genesis to Revelation. And it is a code. And it is consistent across scripture. And the question I don't know the answer to is did the people writing the scripture know that they were also writing a code into it? N we know that scripture was written by people separated by thousands of miles in thousands of years. Different languages three languages at least. And yet, in my reading of this, this code is absolutely consistent. So how do you get a consistent code across something written over thousands of years by 40 authors? How does it work? You have one editor. It's the only way this system works as far as I can decode it. So we'll go from there. Um, Let's talk about the first tree in uh, scripture. Uh, this is uh, Bruegel and Rubens painting of uh, the fall. And um, many of you are probably familiar with both of them. They were the greatest artists of their time and they were both men of God and uh, uh, Rubens in particular, um, incredibly devout and um, uh, serious about his faith and they teamed up because uh, Rubens was the greatest uh, painter of people and uh, Bruegel the best of, of nature and they painted this. Excuse me. And um, this is the fall. Now it's my um, assertion here that if you follow the th trees through scripture they will teach you the theology of the Bible, and they're going to take you someplace. And uh, as I said, every major character has a tree uh, associated with them. Every major event in Scripture has a tree associated with it. Um, and so this is the fall. Now the tree of knowledge of good and evil sits in the middle of the garden. Uh, I deal a lot with people um, who don't necessarily know the Bible. I deal a lot with people who do, but s some of the folks I deal with do not know the Bible. And they are under the uh, illusion, I believe, that humans were set up. As a matter of fact, Life Magazine in 1974 had a cover, um, Eve was framed. Uh, and what the I believe that scripture is trying to tell you here is this the exact opposite. This is right where you can see it. It's where you know what to avoid. God is not setting up humanity uh, here by putting the tree of knowledge of good and evil in, in the middle of the garden. What happens when we eat from this tree? Uh, we fall. Sin comes into the world. One way, by the way, uh, th it's got apples on it. Does anybody know why uh, the tree often has apples on it. It's really, it came about in Latin speaking because um, malum, the, the Latin word uh, for evil is also the word for apple. And so 
Um, I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg there. Uh, but the Bible doesn't specify uh, what type of uh, fruit it was. I think another way that we could um, name this tree is the tree of right and wrong. And that might work better for some people in our age. Uh, to do evil is wrong, is it not? And to do right is good. So the tree of, of, of good and evil c could also be called the tree of right and wrong. And the lesson that it teaches us, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is that sin is real. That is getting to be a very unpopular concept in our society. And I'll tell you a, a story. I was in uh, Manhattan with Nancy uh, probably about eight years ago. And I had been in a movie. And they were show it was a premiere of this movie in Manhattan. And the New York Times religion reporter came up and said hi beforehand. There were, you know, everybody was eating and uh, getting to know each other. And then we went in and we watched the, the, the movie. And then afterwards, a uh, distinguished panel was assembled on stage. I was not distinguished at that time. <laughs> so I wasn't on stage. I was just in the audience listening. And, and people were asking questions and everything. And finally, a question got asked, well, why is bad going on in the world, basically, was the question. And a man on stage who was the head of the National Association of Evangelicals said, it comes down to sin. You cannot understand things going wrong in the world without acknowledging sin. The New York Times religion reporter got up and stomped out in a hissy fit. Sin is no longer popular. And, it, and a popular thing to do is actually, if something's a sin, is to upgrade it to a virtue, or at least downgrade it to a misdemeanor. But the lesson that Christ, or God is teaching us through this tree is that sin is real and has consequences. I would like you to do an exercise. <laughs> I would like you to, wh who was in chapel this morning? Okay. Now you can either do this to yourself or you can turn to your neighbor. Let's only do it to our neighbor, okay? Let's not form in groups and you'll understand why. <laughs> I want you to share, if you can, your first sin. Uh, I want you to think about what was the first time you sinned? When did you do something knowingly that was wrong? Now this isn't knock over the milk at the table, that's clumsiness. If you knock the milk over on purpose, that's a sin, okay? Um, if you don't feel like sharing it with your neighbor, uh, say I pass. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just do this for a minute. Okay, I will stop you, and uh, I'll tell you um, uh, my first sin that I, I really remember, and um, I grew up in pretty modest circumstances, and uh, at the time of my first sin, I'm, I'm a little kid, and my father is in the hospital, and we're told he's going to die. Those are my excuses. <laughs> They're really bad excuses, okay? And uh, 
uh, we lived in a little tiny place, wide spot in the road, and there was a general store up the road. And uh, we went in and there was penny candy, okay? And Mrs. Hawkins was a feared uh, substitute teacher and she was the, you know, the, she and her husband owned this store and uh, she didn't trust children and she didn't trust adults. So I didn't steal anything from there. But we went to the big city, Damascus, Maryland, to the five and 10 cent store and they had uh, a candy named after the world's greatest fear. Do you know what candy I'm talking about? Atomic fireball, you got it. And there they were sitting in a bunker, <laughs> this square glass off thing, and nobody was looking, and I put one in my pocket. I sold my soul <laughs> for one atomic fireball, okay? <laughs> How many of you, in your first sin, stole food or ate some food you weren't supposed to. Raise your hand. Yeah. I suspect that all of our first sin is, involves food. I think you might not remember it. Your mom might have told you to eat your Cheerios and you didn't or something like that and you did it willfully. Uh, but the scripture here is working on something very real, I think. Um, so the first lesson that a tree teaches us in the Bible is that sin is real, we've all sinned, and sin separates us from the Lord. Initially, it separates us from our parents, I think, uh, or, or some figure that the Lord has in, entrusted our care to. Um, and uh, we live thinking we're gonna get out of this life alive, and the bad news is that sin makes that not an option. I'm a doctor. Imagine, what is the hardest job of an ER doctor? It's nobody wants to talk to you. Nobody has ever wanted a phone call from me, okay? <laughs> As an ER doctor. Imagine, I, I had to call somebody one morning and say, I've just looked at your labs and I've got bad news and I've got really bad news. And the patient said, What's the bad news? And I said, you've got 48 hours to live. And he said, what's the really bad news? I couldn't get a hold of you yesterday. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the first tree in scripture teaches us this. It, by the way, if you don't buy the fall, there's no point in going further in scripture. If you don't understand that you've sinned, you don't need God. Uh, and so the first tree is very important, and that's why it's, it, it's there, really. Um, it, you know what this is teaching. None is righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is just Romans road theology here. Nothing, and for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ uh, Jesus our Lord. Um, so this is pretty... Uh, standard uh, theology, and let's go to the next tree in scripture. <clears throat> Does anybody know what kind of tree this is? He distracted them while he got a drink. This is a tree of life. When I read Genesis very closely, there's this amazing thing happening. God is forming Adam and blowing the breath of life into his nostrils and he pivots and he turns on the oxygen on the planet. A, a master artist has a signature style. Rembrandt didn't paint just that painting in three-quarter lighting. He did it again and again because it was a master technique. This is a human respiratory tree. And when I see what's going on in Genesis, I get chills. This is a master designer. So the next tree in scripture is the tree of life. And what is the tree of life? Um, uh, it's life. <laughs> life is good, life is rare, and life is a gift from the Lord. And that's what the next tree in scripture is trying uh, to teach us. Um, 
Right now, we have people searching all over the universe to find, what are they trying to find on Mars? Life. You're trying to find water because with water, you can get life. We spend more on the Hubble telescope than three countries have as their gross national product. <coughs> We're spending tens of billions of dollars looking for life. Why? If you find a piece of life on Mars less complicated than the mold in your bathroom, you're going to get a Nobel Prize. There's a big theologic thing going on here. Um, people are trying to prove that life happens without God. That's what this search is all about. And we, as people who believe in God, need to have a theology about why that's a false trail. We believe that God made life. And so the tree of life is about this. Um, with that tree of life, uh, we were given eternal life. And when we fell, we were separated from it. Now in the book, I'll go into the oxygen connection, the aesthetics, um, and uh, all the other things that happen around the tree of life. But, you know, suffice to say that the tree of life is good. It stands for everything uh, good that there is. Um, it stands for lumber. And I was a carpenter, so that, that's all good. Um, one of the, one of, because this is God's metaphor, uh, she is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Who is the she here? Scripture. Yeah, scripture, the Bible. So the Bible is a tree of life. And I'm not in any, any theologic backwater here. No, anybody dis disagree with that? Well, I've really thought about this a lot. It is a tree of life, but it's not the tree of life. Because here's the difference. The tree of life gives you eternal life. And the Bible doesn't. Who says that? Jesus. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. So really what the Bible does, according to this tree theology, is it leads you to Christ. Christ is the tree of life. So what exactly is the Bible? I've thought about this a lot. Maybe, it has, maybe this is all academic. Um, the closest I can come up with is it is a photograph. Uh, if you think about it, if we had a photograph of any person in here, you could identify them if you'd never seen them, and you can tell them apart from everybody on the planet. Now, it's not that person, but it's an exact representation of that person. Uh, and it, I know that analogy isn't perfect. You can ask questions about it later, but it's as close as I can come up with. The, the, by the way, the, um, the scrolls that uh, Taurus were on were called the Etsy Haim, the Tree of Life. Uh, this is not new theology here. I'm not the first one to pick up on that. That was, and that's why you take hold of her. And I'm sure they had the image that you're taking hold of the scrolls and, and you're learning from that. Um, so um, I would just want to talk about the Bible and where I'm going to go in, um, in the book with this. Uh, so to me, the Bible takes on this magnificent importance because it allows you to identify the tree of life. Uh, and the worst thing you could do with it is Photoshop it. Uh, in my mind, it's okay to translate a Bible to make it more understandable. And I would not say this to any other crowd, but there's people in here that are gonna be involved in Bible translations. It's okay to translate it to make it more understandable. We know that in Qumran, they had two Isaiahs. Who here is an Old Testament scholar? Right? You, have, you have two Isaiahs that were found that are very different. One resembles the Isaiah that we have, and the other was the message version of Isaiah at the time. They had trouble understanding it. Um, and so I, I don't, I 
personally don't think God's gonna get mad at us for trying to make it understandable as long as you always have that original around somewhere and you aren't trying to undo it. And as I think about this, I think about the importance of translating um, accurately. I think about Genesis 126 and 322. If you've read any of the Hebrew thinking about these two lines, and that's let us make man in our image and behold the man has become like one of us knowing good and evil. Jews couldn't stand those two lines. Who's us? Who's we? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. <laughs> Didn't make sense to him. Does it make sense to us? Makes perfect sense. So if any of you are ever involved in Bible translations and you mess up to make it say what you want it to say for some political reasons, you have to, you have to face an awesome God, I think. <laughs> That's just my warning, heads up. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, in, in my experience, um, we, uh, I, I read the Bible as real. I don't try to Photoshop it. I, I think that it is true. I think that it is inspired. In the book, I'll get into more of that. Um, and I actually believe in something called reverse engineering on the Bible. As I've looked at the Bible over the last 10 years, amazed at the number of things that you can reverse engineer. By that I mean things that sort of don't make sense unless you set the compass that the Bible is true, and then you work your understanding back into that. I'll give you an example. Um, I was reading uh, a scholarly article on the book of um, Revelation, and they're talking about the four corners of the earth. You familiar with that? And they're saying, well this, and this was a sort of a liberal interpretation, well this just comes from Babylonian myth, uh, and they had a four corner earth. And, um, and that's just sort of the way they left it. How many quadrants are there on a map? How does your GPS work? Four corners of the earth. <laughs> okay. Uh, equally, there's things, there's many medical things in the scripture I, I, I read across that I just can't believe. Um, and, and they didn't know how they made sense. Uh, Again and again, in both the Old and the New Testament, they say that you think in your brain. The New Testament is very specific. Your ju seat of judgment is in your forehead. What's really wrong with that? They don't know that at the time. We think where? In our brain. At the time of Christ, that's not what medicine thought. They were still embalming people in Egypt. They embalmed the important organs, the ones that you thought with, your pancreas and your stomach and your liver. They scraped the brain out and they threw it in the trash. It's not good for anything. I've met some teenagers like that, but <laughs> <laughs> in general. Um, and so there's just thing after thing that if you decode it, and I, I remember be, uh, being in a class with uh, uh, students in a seminary and talking about the science in, in Genesis, and, and some smart aleck said, well, they separate the firmaments, the top and the bottom, and I'm like, that's nonsense and everything. I'm like, they didn't have a word for liquid. What does this crust of the earth right on top of liquid <laughs> think bigger think always the bible is right and if you have to reverse engineer your way into trying to make it make sense does that make sense okay remember this is the first time i'm giving the talk all right all right how am i doing for time i gotta speed up you're the timekeeper sweetheart what do you okay Are you paying attention okay um <laughs> Okay, the, um, the first name tree in scripture is a fig tree. Whenever something occurs the first time or the last time in scripture or is the only, heads up, it's gonna be on a test, <laughs> okay? Uh, and, and so the fig tree is the first named tree and uh, and again, all the theology is taking place around trees here. Um, they, they'd eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They, f they realized they were naked. They sewed fig, fig leaves together. And they went and they hid behind trees. This is so thick going through all of scripture. It's amazing to me we don't have sermons on any of this. 
and especially because it's in old Bibles. Um, so the um, <coughs> f- just hold on to that fig tree and we'll follow it for a minute, okay? Um, so just one of the things I want to point out is that God calls people when they're by trees. He calls Moses. He calls Abraham. He calls David to battle. I know ministers who got their calling from a tree. Anybody know Joel Hunter? Northland Church? Joel was called by a tree, by the Lord shaking the tree. Um, God teaches people by trees. He teaches, by the way, for the purposes of my talk and most biologists, here's the definition of a tree. It's a big plant with a stick going up the middle. <laughs> Quote unquote from Colin Trudge's The Tree. Okay, so biologists writing about trees. Uh, so a bush counts, that sort of thing. So God teaches people by trees. He teaches uh, Jonah, he teaches Elijah, he teaches Isaac, and God hears prayers by trees, including people in contemporary time. It's not just Hagar, but Martin Luther. Uh, anybody know how Martin Luther came to God? Lightning hit a tree. He said, St. Anne, save me, if you will. I'll give you my whole life. By the way, in my experience, that's the one kind of let's make a deal prayer God loves to hear. You offer him everything, and you're, you can be amazed how many people have done that and God comes right through. It's generally we're offering nothing, okay? But I have done a let's make a deal prayer with God and I promise you that he'll take you up on it if you offer him everything, <laughs> okay? So uh, <coughs> I would, the, the next trees uh, uh, are in scripture aren't really so much trees as weeds. Next thing uh, that um, really comes up in scripture is the thorns and the thistles in the vines. Um, we can go into that. I'm not going to you. If you want to ask questions about it, you can. I want to get us to some of the more exciting stuff. Because all these blaze trees, and remember I'm giving you a, a little talk off of a whole book. All these blaze trees are leading us to who? Tree of life. Tree of life, yeah. Um, and so let's look at some messianic prophecy in scripture. <coughs> This is a really important messianic prophecy. It's probably one of the most important in the Old Testament. <coughs> His body shall not remain all night on a tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. It's really important. It's brought up again in Hebrews. For there is hope, this is out of Job, For there is hope for a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease, though its roots grow old in the earth, and its stump die in the soil. Yet at the scent of water, it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. Really important messianic uh, prophecy. (coughs) Again from Job, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the last day, and the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see him. And of course we know that uh, in uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, 14 uh, takes this up. Um, another messianic prophecy. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. This is the only description of Christ, of the look of Christ. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And of course, Handel and the Messiah just makes pure magic out of of, uh, this prophecy here. So what all of this is doing is leading us to Christ. It's leading us in God's way. And God writes in nature. God is using all of this to lead us uh, to Christ. So let's talk about uh, Christ for a moment. Um, I really call him, you could almost call him tree boy. (laughs) Uh, And Christ is born. And to celebrate 
these uh, magi, these wise men, show up and they bring three gifts, do they not? One is gold. What are the other two? Trees. They're the products from trees. So two-thirds of the gifts that Christ is going to be given are, are trees, uh, are made from trees. Uh, now, this only makes sense for the story. What does, what does Joseph do for a living? Thank you. Because these smart alecks that say tecton doesn't translate uh, as necessarily carpenter are trying to mess with this story. It doesn't make any sense in a way when you start following the code that he would be in any other place. And this is pure speculation, pure speculation. But Jesus, in reading scripture closely, talks to a carpenter in me. He makes a carpentry joke that tells me that he was in a carpenter's shop. Because working with wood back then, uh, the saws were pretty, the, the blades on them are pretty wide. There is no sandpaper. They burnish wood to get it smooth. Um, they can plane. They have bronze planes back then. There's only one activity that makes sawdust, really. It's turning wood. And Jesus talks about sawdust in your eye and two by fours in your eye. To me, that is a carpentry joke. And it's told by a guy who was in a carpentry shop. So it's speculation. Don't hold me to it or anything. But I think Jesus is saying, and I, I love to just imagine that maybe Joseph, one of the jobs that Joseph had uh, was turning those scrolls, the Etsy Hayam. And that maybe, and they had to fit them on those. And that probably would have taken place in the shop. And that Jesus had access to all the scriptures like nobody else did. How else did he go toe to toe at bar mitzvah time and blow him out of the water? He's obviously had an education that's incredible. Um, and so Jesus does this. Um, and uh, I want you to think about Jesus for a moment as the model for the superhero. We just think of Jesus, the mild-mannered Jesus. But Jesus is a superhero. He's the model for Superman. And in, for my money, don't give me Iron Man. Don't give me the guy who spits webs out of his, give me Superman, okay? There are many similarities. Superman and Jesus, do, they're not from around here. <laughs> they never show you their superpowers except for once as they're coming up on the teen years, right? They never use their superpowers to get themselves ahead. One of the things about a superhero is they're hard to kill, are they not? Can you shoot Superman? Dr. George, can you shoot Superman with a gun and do anything, any damage? Very difficult. Very difficult. Um, can, can, you, uh, uh, can you blow him up with a bomb? No. Jesus is really hard to kill. You can't stab him. All this has been tried. They've tried to stab him. It doesn't work. They've tried to stone him. It doesn't work. They've tried to throw him off a cliff. It doesn't work. You cannot feed this guy for 120 meals, something like that, and he can go three rounds with the devil and win. Okay? There's no point in trying to drown him. We know that. <laughs> okay? It's really hard to kill this guy. He is the model for the superhero. The only way that you're generally going to kill a, a real superhero is if they decide to give themselves up. And this is that prophecy about he who dies on a tree is cursed. Jesus has to be cursed. Not he who is stoned is cursed. He who is stabbed is cursed. He who is drowned is cursed. Only he who dies on a tree. And I've even thought about when is Jesus, when does God decide to step into the world? I don't think he could do it today in our legal system. Because in the legal system that Jesus is tried in, he is guilty until proven innocent. And to scream, I'm innocent, 
or I'm guilty, he doesn't really do, does he? By merely holding his mouth shut, he is entering the guilty plea. He cannot lie. He's just keeping his mouth shut and he's entering this guilty plea. And he's going to die on what? A tree. It's the only way the theology of the scripture works. And he's just like Isaac, you know, um, in that story where the lamb is put on the tree. He's the Passover blood on the door of heaven. His blood on the cross lets you through that narrow door into, into heaven. Um, that is my introduction <laughs> to the theology of trees. It goes on and on and on. By the way, the fig tree, the only one I ask you to follow, Nathaniel, Bartholomew, bad mouths Jesus' hometown, does he not? You can't even get a decent cup of coffee in Nazareth. He says that to Jesus, and Jesus says, you know, a true son of Israel in whom there is no guile. And he knows that's the Messiah. And it's really an unusual calling of a disciple because he knows just like that. He isn't told. He knows. How does, how does he know? Because Jesus saw him praying under a fig tree. Not an accident. I think it's Jesus trying to say, this is the original way you played hide and seek with us. And you're not going to do this anymore. We see you. Um, by the way, the King James tr translates Genesis 2.15, our creation care, you know, banner to uh, abat and shamar, protect and, and keep the garden or whatever. The King James pr uh, translates that to dress and keep. These translators are brilliant because Adam and Eve are naked and unashamed. Everything takes care of them but they dress and keep the garden. When they fall, they strip the garden in order to hide their shame. And so Jesus, uh, that you can't hide behind a fig tree to get away from Jesus, and it's the last thing he blasts. It's the only thing he kills. Um, there are many, many relationships like this that flow through. I am not a theologian. All I want to do is spur people with a lot more brains than me to go through the Bible and figure some of this out. So, um, what is the take home point from all of this? I think God uh, likes trees, talks to us uh, through that. Does God ever want us to worship a tree? Absolutely not. And, and trees can be worshiped. The Asherah tree is bad. Uh, you got, if, if you're worshiping trees, chainsaw it down. <laughs> I'm not advocating that at all. Uh, but the tree of life, which is scripture, should be very, very high in your planting. Uh, and I would challenge people, when is the last time you planted a real tree? And when is the last time you planted a tree of life, which is scripture? Uh, if you haven't given a Bible to somebody in, in the last few months, you're not throwing seeds out there probably like you should be. Uh, that's my take home point. Should I write the book or not? <laughs> okay, so uh, questions. <coughs> Questions you'd have for uh, Dr. Sleeth at this time? I think um, I'm looking for Emily. There's our uh, Jennifer. We have a uh, over here's Dr. George, Jennifer, and uh, Dr. George. If you would uh, ask your question. Thank you, well, Dr. Sleeth. Please write this book. <laughs> Thank you. And I look forward to reading it. Thank you, Dr. George. And quite frankly, when I met, when we saw after a year in the corridor. I said, please move to North Carolina. We have lovely magnolia trees. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Even in the campus. But my question is, the point you made about Luther, I never heard that, that plant a tree. I think that is a message for creation stewardship. Plant a tree. And then Schaefer, your Schaefer medalist, and Schaefer wrote a book when Christendom was blamed for all the destruction, including trees, animals. Trees also harbor vast number of wild animals, all arboreal animals. So from creation, 
care perspective. How do we save the trees? And will you address that in your book? I, I will. Uh, I think that we are naturally, uh, by the way, just the story of what trees do for us. Uh, we all grew up knowing that they make oxygen. Think about how anybody knew that before you were taught that in elementary school. That the breath of life that we depend on uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, physiologically comes from a tree is kind of uh, a, a stretch. And um, uh, so it, it's, n it's not until 1777, I think, that, um, that, that this is discovered. Um, and yet I in scriptures, I read it, there it is, the first, the first page of the Bible, um, that, that God has blown this breath uh, into man, and then the first thing in the Genesis 2 creation story is gives them the trees. Uh, so trees are, are, are one of our greatest inheritances, really, on this planet. They're renewable, of course. I think another reason that God uses uh, the tree is that it is the most long-lived uh, uh, organism on the planet. Um, and if, we, w if you think about what is the centerpiece of most homes, uh, what is your most comfortable couch or chair face? It's generally a television, is it not? But as we read in Revelation, it's, it's a tree of life. Um, and so we know that God holds trees in really very high regard. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, the, I, one of the things I'll do, and I think I just need to illustrate it as well as using the illustrations out of some of these older Bibles and, and things, are um, I've got some pictures of trees that people affixed uh, plaques to two and three hundred years ago. In, it was an, a common thing to do in New England uh, when people were born or married or came to the Lord. And you can be in the middle of the woods and, uh, and find these iron plaques on trees that are several hundred years old. Um, there's one by a church uh, in Phippsburg, Maine that kind of gives me the chills. In 1774 it was put on as they dedicated the church. Uh, and so I, I'll, I'll try to bring some of those things in. Over here, question over here. I, I just had a quick question. I was just thinking about it. Um, is there any kind of metaphor um, when I think about urban sprawl and uh, especially in the South, uh, as, as we kind of build up cities, the number of trees that get torn down to make room for development? Yeah. <laughs> and just in, any thoughts on that? Well, I think a lot of our ethics are, that might evolve around trees, and I'm not an ethicist, you know, come from Old Testament. And Old Testament tells us not to cut them down willy-nilly. Uh, even in a time of war, especially if they bear fruit, we're not to cut them down. Um, the tree is almost personified in, in that. And in the setting up of the ideal city, there's a green space around it. And I think about Atlanta now, they've got that belt line going around and how it's really exciting this city and it's the thing to be on that belt line and it's all brand new and they say which you know, student came up with it. I'm like, I think that is in the Deuteronomy. <laughs> you know, so it's been there. Um, I, I think we have been kind of wanton in our, in our use of trees. I, trees are a renewable resource. Uh, I was a carpenter. I think it's magnificent to make things uh, out of wood. Um, so I'm not you know, opposed to using them. Um, but we are told that the when the Lord judges the earth, the trees are the first ones giving each other high fives there. Um, we know that they are involved somehow in glorifying the Lord. The trees of the forest clap their hands. Uh, that sort of thing. So I would just urge people to be a little more grateful and thankful. This is where the oxygen on the planet uh, comes from. Again, I think that's there in Genesis as you read it more carefully. So, <coughs> Question here, Dr. Lederbach. Matthew, I was down at the beach yesterday and as I, uh, my wife and I had dinner and we looked out the window right behind us at the booth we were in and there was a bumper sticker on the back of the car that said tree hugging dirt worshiper. That was the uh, form of religion that the person who owned the car had. 
And I'm wondering, as you speak to evangelicals about trees, how much of that fear that your work is going to actually make people think that you're just about tree hugging, dirt worshiping, that kind of, there's just an inherent fear. And you've actually kind of built your talk to kind of allay those kind of fears. So uh, I wonder if you could address us as evangelicals on how to handle this well, yeah. uh, to, just to be thinking along those lines. I, um, I believe uh, that we are involved in a spiritual battle here on earth and in our life and that um, uh, the enemy wants to separate us in every way from God. Uh, that God gave us this magnificent gift and the enemy wants to separate us from it. Um, and, um, and so I would say, who's really trying to, s who's really trying to separate us from this? And it, it's, it's the enemy. Uh, trees are God's gift to the planet, really. Um, they are where the air comes from. And uh, I think scripture's clear that at times, um, people, people, by the way, will worship anything. You know, I've noticed when they say just high places, I think some of those places were just mounds of dirt. Humans are meant to worship. We are built to worship. We have no choice. Uh, we are gonna worship something if we don't worship God. Uh, and some people might worship a tree, or that might be their religion. But I have to tell you that in my experience of even being in the environmental world, it's a whole lot easier to get a bunch of people together to worship a whole lot of other things before they worship trees. Even in San Francisco, I don't think you can get a thousand people out there uh, around the, you know, the Cathedral Grove in Mirror Woods. Um, and so I think we have to acknowledge that anything, e even a bronze serpent that's held up that, that cures disease can become an object of worship. And I've really thought about this. Everything that Christ does, Christ knows where it's going to be taken over the next thousands of years. If, if Christ had used a comb to comb his hair, we'd be worshiping combs. But Christ died on a tree, and that cross is about as close as we get, you know. Um, why, and I, I don't want some uh, body with a bumper sticker to separate me from the cross. This is the language that God used to write the Bible. And so, yes, somebody would carry it to an extreme and separate, it, separate us from it, but it's scriptural from one end to the other. And I, won't, I refuse to have somebody separate me from, from uh, scripture. Uh, Brandon have a question? Brandon here. So Dr. Sleeth, uh, assuming I've read your book and I understand your ideas, or the new book coming up, and I wanted to teach it to a class or a discipleship group or something like that, what should my expectations for what I want to have change in the lives of my disciples or students as they hear these ideas? What should I actually expect as in life change? Uh, I, I think that one of the things I would like to have happen is that people pick up their Bible with a new respect. Um, that, uh, that there is this code that goes from one end to the other. This, this Bible had one editor <laughs> across all of its, its writing. And um, that, that God could have given us many other metaphors. Uh, I've, I've really thought about the language of Christ. Christ's language is unique. I was in a seminary uh, once and somebody uh, said, well, the language of Jesus is the vernacular. The thing was that Jesus was talking to a bunch of hayseeds. Not much special going on. That was the underlying message behind what that person was articulating, although they might not have understood that they were trying to knock the authority of scripture. But Christ's language is so organic, it stuns me as somebody who studied organic chemistry once. Um, when I say organic, I don't mean a particular thing they sell in a health food store. I mean carbon-based chemistry. That's what the uh, definition of organic chemistry. And so that Christ again and again and again is using this metaphor and he just, everything, your faith is like that. I'm the vine and, and God's the vine dresser. It just goes on and on and on. Is he talking a vernacular? I don't think so. 
There's some reasons I don't think so. As I look at writing contemporary to Christ, I don't see it used anywhere. If it was a vernacular that Jesus were speaking just so that the common person understood him, why does he have to leave us a Rosetta Stone in the parable of four sto- soils? So even the people around him are not understanding it. And it just goes on and on as you begin to deconstruct, as it were, the, the lang- this organic language of Christ, that it, the Bible is filled with gems, are they not? There's barrel and, and uh, all these other gems that they're, they're talking about. What are the gates of heaven made out of? Pearls, right? But the only gem that Christ mentions is a pearl. What's unique about a pearl as a gem? It's the only organic gem that there is. As I come at this from every direction, it sends chills up my spine because it's all planned. (laughs) It's all thought out. It may take us a couple years, a thousand years of science to catch up to it, but it's all there. So the first thing would be to pick up scripture and see it in a new and invigorated way because we can study it so much it becomes old to us. So that's one of my goals here, that scripture is, uh, we have a revitalized way of looking at it. I believe scripture is living and it'll teach us new things as we ask it new questions. Um, The other is to not let um, uh, Satan separate us from this magnificent gift of the earth that God has given us. This is our birthright, this is our inheritance, (laughs) those trees out there. Um, that, that we don't thank the Lord for them is a shame. And I think the second is that we, we really have to be leading people to that ultimate tree of life, which is the cross. And we do that through Bible. The Bible's been knocked down by so many people in so many ways. I think people knock it and they don't even realize that they're doing it. There are Bible commentaries that I, if I could have a book burning, I would just burn them. <laughs> because all, they do not build up the faith. It's some snarky little comment about this or that. Uh, whereas the more I study it through the trees, the more magnificent it becomes to me. So it's a new way of, of looking at, at the gospel and the tree that hopefully, if things go right for people, they'll be looking at for eternity. Have time for one more question. The, um, you, you spoke both this morning and uh, uh, this, this evening. And this morning you spoke on uh, the important principle of Sabbath rest. Would you have a word perhaps for students who find themselves at that time in their lives in which they have so many pressures? Uh, their activities in their church, their jobs, their families, their schools, uh, the school responsibilities, it seems like uh, they are, you know, they, they have more to do than they can do in a day, and then you come in and tell them they need to stop. Can you give them just a word on saying, okay, how, how, how can a busy student, how can they prioritize the principle of having a time of rest, a Sabbath? That's a great question. Uh, <clears throat> One is that I'm not speaking to you out of theory. I've practiced Sabbath for a dozen years. I have done that with a sometimes grueling schedule, per se. Uh, And again and again, I encounter people in the faith who have stuck to a a Sabbath without budging from it. And the Lord has blessed that. And I mentioned Eugene Peterson. He's one of those people. Can you expect to get more done in a lifetime than Eugene Peterson? Uh, I don't think so. And I, I, I talked even to, in this film, Take It, I mean, I, you don't have to leave a donation if you want to, fine, if you don't, fine, doesn't matter to me. Uh, but I have a conversation with uh, David Green from Hobby Lobby, who, uh, his stores are only open 66 hours a week. This guy, I, I've been to their main place. It's, they need dump trucks to bring the money in. It's just, it's insane. I'm not preaching prosperity gospel. But, but, <coughs> but, but buy that book for just $9.99. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, so these people took, uh, David Green to, took a hundred million dollar a year ch- chance on Sabbath. He closed his stores on Sunday after being open for almost 20 years on Sunday when the stores were bringing $100 million a year on Sunday. Um, the Lord has blessed that. Did he lose money the first year? Yes, he did. <laughs> but not the second and not the third year. Uh, I think that the Sabbath was given to us to build community. It's meant to be a place of fellowship. And, uh, and so I would recommend to do this in community. Uh, pick your time. Uh, you don't start Sabbathing mid-semester when you're overwhelmed. You do it at the beginning of a semester. Uh, a, st- a student who, who prepared uh, themselves for this during the summer uh, and went from, me and this was an undergraduate student, went from having a D average to an A average when they did this. See, that was what's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but but it orders it orders your life. It it allows you uh, to, and the reality is that most of you in here are wasting a ton of time. Whether that's in front of a screen, Facebooking or watching CSI or whatever. Okay, um, the average American spends six hours in front of a screen, not working <laughs> every day. Uh, so for me, for us, we don't do television. Uh, and, uh, but I would say that to, to um, the other thing to do, and I don't want to forget this, uh, is this is only going to get worse in your lifetime. The earth is only, uh, the world is only going to speed up. There are only going to be more demands on you. And there's only going to be less time for God. You need to get on your knees and say, I need help. Uh, a piece of scripture that I really love about this is Second Chronicles 30. Uh, Hezekiah is king, and they have lost the Passover celebration. We're not there yet. We still have Christmas. <laughs> we still have Easter. They've lost Passover. Fathom that. Try to get your head around that. And if you just look at that one chapter about everything that's done to reinstitute it, they miss the date. The priests, the clergy aren't prepared. They have none of the systems in place. He uses social media. <laughs> he sends out emissaries to talk about this. They but the most important thing is they plead with the Lord to forgive them and to get it right. And they celebrate it for the wrong amount of time, for two weeks instead of one. Um, but we are not the first people to have lost our connection with the Lord because time didn't permit. Um, so I would say do it in community, prepare, get on your knees. Those would be my pieces of advice. Take a film. I will do anything I can to help this community you know, regain this gift because uh, Satan wants to take it away from you.